Hello and welcome to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carl Esterbrook. We're recording this at midday on Tuesday, August 20th, in the studios of Urbana Public Television. Recordings of earlier programs and links to the articles we refer to today can be found on the Facebook page for Aware of Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Comments on this program are welcome. Email us at cgesterbrook at gmail.com. Our program concentrates on the news of U.S. war making, which is generally not reported, not by accident, in the U.S. media. War making by the U.S. elite doesn't change unless we insist. The U.S. media, owned by large corporations, continue to tell us how terrible President Trump is. But that's a way to avoid talking about how far more terrible U.S. government war making is. In regard to killing people around the world, the Trump administration's policy seems little different from that of the Obama administration. President Obama inherited two shameful wars from the Bush administration in Afghanistan and Iraq. He increased the number to eight, attacking Libya, Pakistan, the Philippines, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen as well. He became the first U.S. president ever to be at war throughout two terms. No other U.S. president before Obama did that. Not even President Lincoln in the Civil War, nor President Wilson in World War I, nor President Roosevelt in World War II. As Barack Obama said in 2012, after ordering drone assassinations of American citizens, including a teenager, and he did that purposely, quote, turns out I'm really good at killing people. Didn't know that was going to be a strong suit of mine, close quote. That's Barack Obama. Perhaps even more dangerously, he continued America's longest standing foreign policy, attempting to prevent the integration of Eurasia for fear that that would retard the U.S. elite's economic exploitation of the rest of the world by American war provocations against Russia and China from Ukraine to the South China Sea. Trump, after criticizing Obama's war making, has largely continued it. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has killed more than 20 million people in wars in Korea, Vietnam, Latin America, the Mideast, and elsewhere, designed to destroy challenges to the economic hegemony the U.S. obtained as the only major company largely undamaged by World War II. Russia lost 27 million people in defeating Nazism. U.S. losses in all of World War II totaled about half a million people. That's why today international polls show that the U.S. is the most feared government in the world, not China, Russia, Iran, or Israel. The Trump administration is not the problem. U.S. war making is. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. government remains what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. With other peace groups around the world, we call upon our president and government to close all U.S. military bases on foreign soil, bring all U.S. troops and weapons home, and provide social supports including free medical care, education, and a universal basic income for Americans who've been made poorer by generations of our government's wars. Send your opinion on these matters to your representatives in Congress. Email addresses for Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Tammy Duckworth, and Representative Rodney Davis are on our Facebook page at Aware of Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. In this program, Aware on the Air, a local discussion of war news is on Urbana Public Television, Tuesdays at 10 p.m., and repeated and on YouTube. Comments on, about what you hear on Aware on the Air can be sent to me at cgesterbrook at gmail.com. We've received the following comment from a listener. Quote, Carl is very good at saying Trump is not the problem and making whatever excuses available for what Trump does or for not doing what he said he would do as a candidate. 
Carl's duplicity in blaming Obama for everything is blatantly obvious and kills the credibility of a weir, close quote. I don't take that as a summary of my position, but still, in answer, I must say that I've apparently failed to make my view of the U.S. political situation quite clear. I think, in fact, my view does not diverge substantially from that of commentators like Pepe Escobar, Aaron Maté, or Noam Chomsky, all of whom I recommend to you on these matters. The problem is the consistent policies followed by all U.S. administrations since the collapse of the USSR, and in some ways before it. War and war provocations abroad by the U.S., that's neoconservatism, and austerity and market fundamentalism at home by the U.S., that's neoliberalism. Neoconservatism and neoliberalism are complementary, not contradictory, and are the real policies of the U.S. government in every administration, no matter what they may say to get elected. Those policies have produced 40 years of growing and accelerating concentration of wealth in the U.S. But that's experienced by a majority of Americans as the confiscation of the lifestyles taken for granted in their parents' generation. The response is an inchoate but growing populism, a popular view that, quote, pits a virtuous and homogeneous people against a series of elites and dangerous others who are together depicted as depriving or attempting to deprive the sovereign people of their rights, values, prosperity, identity, and voice, close quote. That view is not easily expressed by our usual left-right distinctions, but it did produce the Trump presidency. The abandonment of class politics by American liberals in the 1970s for fear of where it would lead, that is, some form of socialism, led them to substitute identity politics as the content of the liberal left position. The proliferation of identities masked the bankruptcy of liberalism. That was recognized by many Americans, however obscurely, as the mendacity of hope in the Obama administration. Trump was the first major party presidential candidate in 40 years to attack neoliberalism and neoconservatism, and his tapping into inchoate populism, however intuitive it was, made him president. But the history of his administration is a history of acquiescence to those very policies. It's been suggested that Trump is in fact the weakest U.S. president since Calvin Coolidge, making up and bluster what he lacks in effectiveness. Witnesses attempts this month to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria and Afghanistan, attempts frustrated by his own administration, notably Bolton and Pompeo, and the political establishment as a whole, including the Democrats and mainstream media. The disingenuous resistance, as it's called, is an attempt to highlight Trump's obvious personal failings in order to restore the neolib and neocon status quo ante, not to change it, by threatening Trump with replacement. Do what your predecessor did or you will be replaced, is what he's told. In response, he fans, insofar as he's able, those populist flames and their less attractive features. The problem is that the populists are correct. The majority of Americans are, in fact, oppressed by a set of elites who are depriving the sovereign people of their rights, values, prosperity, identity, and voice. Rights which the American people came to expect in the generation after World War II. The populist movement is a fact, and Trump is its temporary beneficiary, and perhaps only partly aware of what it is. To many Americans, to make America great again means to restore their confiscated life, ch life chances. But the American elite is in fact confiscating their chances and those of others around the world for its own profit. It's the program of the American political establishment who are bothered by the fear that the administration may actually abandon aspects of neoliberalism and neoconservatism under pressure of the rising populist wave, even if they now show few signs of doing so. Page three, I want to make a couple of remarks below about the severe difficulty 
of maintaining and instituting democracy, the powerful forces that have always opposed it, the achievements of somehow salvaging and enhancing it, and the significance of that for the future. But first, a couple of words about the challenges that we face, which you all know about. I don't have to go into them in detail. To describe these challenges as extremely severe would be an error. The phrase does not capture the enormity of the kinds of challenges that lie ahead. And any serious discussion of the future of humanity must begin by recognizing a critical fact that the human species is now facing a question that has never before arisen in human history, a question that has to be answered quickly. Will human society survive for long? As you know, for 70 years we've been living under the shadow of nuclear war. Those who've looked at the record can only be amazed that we've survived this far. Time after time, it's come extremely close to terminal disaster, even minutes away. It's a kind of miracle that we've survived. But miracles don't go on forever. This has to be terminated and quickly. The recent nuclear posture review of the Trump administration dramatically increases the threat of conflagration, which would in fact be terminal for the species. We may remember that this nuclear posture review was sponsored by Jim Mattis, who was regarded as too civilized to be retained in the administration. That gives you a sense of what can be tolerated in the Trump, Pompeo, Bolton world. There were three major treaties, arms treaties, the ABM treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and the INF Treaty inter inter on Intermediate Nuclear Forces, the New START Treaty. The U.S. pulled out of the ABM Treaty in 2002, and anyone who believes that any ballistic missiles are defensive weapons is deluded about the nature of these systems. The U.S. has just pulled out of the INF Treaty, established by Gorbachev and Reagan in 1987, which sharply reduced the threat of war in Europe, which would very quickly spread. Massive public demonstrations were the background for leading to a treaty that made a very significant difference. It's worth remembering that, and maybe many other cases where significant popular activism has made a huge difference. The lessons are too obvious to enumerate. The Trump administration has just withdrawn from the INF Treaty. The Russians withdrew right afterwards. If you take a close look, you find that each side has a kind of a credible case saying that the opponent has not lived up to the treaty. But those who want a picture of how the Russians might look at it, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the major journal on arms control issues, had a lead article a couple of weeks ago by Theodore Postel pointing out how dangerous the U.S. installations of anti-ballistic missiles on the Russian border are and can be perceived to be by the Russians. Notice, on the Russian border, tensions are mounting on the Russian border. Both sides are carrying out provocative actions. In a rational world, what would happen would be negotiations between the two sides with independent experts to evaluate the charges that each is making against the other to lead to a resolution of these charges and restore the treaty. That's a rational world. But it's unfortunately not the world we're living in. No efforts at all have been made in this direction, and they won't be unless there is significant pressure. That leaves the New START Treaty. The New START Treaty has already been designated by the figure in charge, who has modestly described himself as the greatest president in American history. He gave it the usual designation of anything that was done by his predecessors. The worst treaty that ever happened in human history. We've got to get rid of it. If, in fact, this comes up for renewal right after the next election, and a lot is at stake, a lot is at stake if, in whether the, that treaty will be renewed. It has succeeded in very significantly reducing the number of nuclear weapons to a level way above what they ought to be, but way below what they were before, and it could go on. Meanwhile, global warming proceeds on its inexorable course. During this millennium, every single year, with one exception, has been hotter than the one before. That means in the century, since uh, the year 2000. There are recent scientific papers that indicate that the pace of global warming, 
which has been increasing since about 1980, may be sharply escalating and may be moving from linear growth to exponential growth, which means doubling every couple of decades. We're already approaching the conditions of 125,000 years ago, when the sea level was roughly 25 feet higher than it is today, with the melting, the rapid melting of the Antarctic, huge ice fields. We might, uh, we, we might in fact reach that point, the consequences of which are more, uh, are almost unimaginable. Meanwhile, while this is going on, you regularly read in the press euphoric accounts of how the United States is advancing in fossil fuel production. It's now surpassed Saudi Arabia. We're in the lead of fossil, fossil fuel production, oil, coal, and so forth. The big banks, J.P. Morgan Chase and others, are pouring money into new investments in fossil fuels, including the most dangerous, like Canadian tar sands. And this is all presented with great euphoria, excitement. We're now reaching energy independence. We can control the world determine the use of fossil fuels in the world. Barely a word on what the meaning of this is, which is quite obvious. It's not that the reporters, commentators don't know about it, that the CEO of the banks don't know about it. Of course they do. But these are kind of institutional pressures that just are extremely hard to extricate themselves from. Try to put yourself in the position of, say, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest bank, which is spending large sums in investment in fossil fuels. He certainly knows everything that we all know about global warming. It's no secret. But what are the choices? Basically, he has two choices. One choice is to do exactly what he is doing. The other choice is to resign and be replaced by someone else who will do exactly what he is doing. It's not an individual problem. It's an institutional problem which can be met, but only under tremendous public pressure. And we've recently seen very dramatically how the solution can be reached. A group of young people, the Sunrise Movement, organized, got to the point of sitting in in congressional offices, aroused some interest from the new progressive figures who were able to make it to Congress. Under a lot of popular pressure, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, joined by Ed Markey, actually placed a Green New Deal on the agenda. That's a remarkable achievement. Of course, it gets hostile attacks from everywhere. It doesn't matter. A couple of years ago, it was unimaginable that it would be even discussed. As the result of the activism of this group of young people, it's now right in the center of the agenda. It's got to be implemented in one form or another. It's essential for survival. Maybe not exa in exactly that form, but some modification of it. Tremendous change achieved by the commitment of a small group of young people. That tells you the kind of thing that can be done. Meanwhile, the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists last January was set at two minutes to midnight. That's the closest it's been to terminal disaster since 1947. The announcement of the settlement mentioned the two major familiar threats, the threat of nuclear war, which is increasing, the threat of global warming, which is increasing further. And it added a third for the first time, the undermining of democracy. That's the third threat, along with global warming and nuclear war. And that was quite appropriate, because functioning democracy offers the only hope of overcoming these threats. They're not going to be dealt with by major institutions, state or private, acting without massive public pressure, which means that the means of democratic functioning have to be kept alive, used the way the Sunshine Movement did it, the way the great mass demonstrations in the early 80s did it, and the way we continue in some places today. The world is actually becoming less green, scientists have found. Plant growth is declining all over the planet, and new research links the phenomenon to decreasing moisture in the air, a consequence of climate change. A study published this week points to satellite observations that revealed expanding vegetation worldwide during much of the 1980s and 90s. But then about 20 years ago, the trend stopped. 
Since then, more than half of the world's vegetated landscapes have been experiencing a browning trend, or decrease in plant growth. Climate records suggest that declines are associated with a metric known as vapor pressure deficit. That's the difference between the amount of moisture the air actually holds versus the maximum amount of moisture it could be holding. A high deficit is sometimes referred to as an atmospheric drought. Since the late 1990s, more than half of the world's vegetated landscapes have experienced a growing deficit or drying pattern. Climate models indicate that vapor pressure deficit is likely to continue increasing as the world warms, a pattern that might have a substantially negative effect on vegetation, the authors write. It's not the first study to document the global decline in vegetation. A 2010 study in the periodical Science was among the first to demonstrate that the greening increases of the 1990s had stalled or reversed. That study also suggested that the declines were probably water-related. That's not to say every last corner of Earth is losing its vegetation. Some recent studies have revealed that parts of the Arctic are greening as the chilly landscape warms. And there's increasing plant growth still happening in other regions of the world as well. But on a global scale, averaged across, across the entire planet, the trend is pointing downward. Page 5, Neoliberalism Again. The CEO worker pay gap widens. Evidence of neoliberalism continuing apace. CEO uh, uh, company owners and uh, directors, a CEO compensation has grown 940% since 1978. Have your wages grown 940% since 1978? Typical worker compensation has risen only 12% during that time. What this report finds is that the increased focus on growing inequality has led to an increased focus on CEO pay. Corporate boards running America's largest public firms are giving top executives outside co outsize compensation packages. Average pay of CEOs at the top 350 firms in 2018 was 17.2 million, or 14 million using a more conservative measure. Stock options make up a big part of CEO pay packages, and the conservative measure values the options when granted versus when cashed in or realized. CEO compensation is very high relative to typical worker compensation, a ratio of 270 to 1. In contrast, the CEO to typical worker compensation ratio, ratio was 20 to 1 in 1965 and 58 to 1 in 1989. CEOs are even making a lot more, about five times as much, as other earners in the top one-tenth the top one -tenth of 1%. From 1978 to 2018, CEO compensation grew by 1,000% far outstripping S&P Standard & Poor stock market growth, 700%, and the wage growth of very high earners, 300, only 340%. In contrast, wages for the typical worker grew by just 12%. Why does it matter? Exorbitant CEO pay is a major contributor to rising inequality that we could safely do away with. CEOs are getting more because of their power to set pay, not because they're increasing productivity or possess specific high-demand skills. This escalation of CEO compensation and of executive compensation more generally has fueled the growth of top 1% incomes, leaving less of the fruits of economic growth for ordinary workers and widening the gap between very high earners and the bottom 90%. The, the economy would suffer no harm if CEOs were paid less or taxed more. How we can solve the problem? We need to enact policy solutions that would both reduce incentives for CEOs to extract economic concessions and limit their ability to do so. Such policies could include reinstating higher marginal income tax rates at the very top, 
setting corporate tax rates higher for firms that have higher ratios of CEO to worker compensation, establishing a luxury tax on compensation such that for every dollar in compensation over a set cap, a firm must pay a dollar in taxes, reforming corporate governance to give other stakeholders better tools to exercise countervailing power against CEOs' pay demands, and allowing greater use of say on pay, which allows a firm shareho firm's shareholders to vote on top executives' salaries, compensation. Uh, for a basic analysis of what produces this situation, Thomas Piketty's book, Capitalism in the 21st Century, remains indispensable. Don't be put off by people who tell you it's too hard to read. It's not. Uh, and it is a brilliant uh, analysis of how the uh, economic structure of particularly the United States has changed uh, in our lifetimes. You have been watching Aware on the Air, produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Andrew Scalroy. Thanks to him also, this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. Comments on this program are welcome. Email us at cgestabrook at gmail.com. We rely on our researcher, Jeff Nicholson, whose blog, Digital Citizen, we recommend highly. We steal from it regularly. There's a link to it on our Facebook page, along with Jeff's detailed notes to this program. We'll conclude tonight with videos selected by Jeff. First, Aaron Maté on how compliant the Democratic Party is, including those who back the so-called resistance to President Trump, as the Trump administration intensifies its anti-Venezuela sanctions via a new executive order. The Democrats' opposition is not there. Secondly, on contact with Chris Hedges, Chris Hedges interviews Max Blumenthal of the Gray Zone Project regarding his new book, The Management of Savagery, How America's National Security State Fueled the Rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump. This wide-ranging discussion covers how Donald Trump to be elected to U.S. Uh, how Donald Trump came to be elected U.S. president, the scam residue group that is the White Helmets, the origins of RussiaGate, and corporate media replete with contributions from the CIA as they transition from the so-called war on terror to what Blumenthal calls something much bigger. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about, but Americans don't. Assange, Manning, Snowden, and others, who are truth-tellers persecuted by the U.S. government, and particularly, by the way, by our liberal Democrat Senator Durbin, a shill for the Russiagate propaganda and unconstitutional attacks on the free press, notably in the case of WikiLeaks. Now, this is Carl Osterbrook for the members and friends of AWARE, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, saying in the words of the late newsman Edward R. Murrow, good night and good luck. <laughs>